Hello, dear subscribers of Gaia's Voice. Thank you for being with me again. I had originally planned on offering you a different topic for this issue than what you're about to hear. And as you might imagine, with some of the recent earth changes uh, in Haiti recently, and of course now again in Chile, a part of me wants to reach out and respond with a topic on earth changes. And I hesitated on this as well, because as you may already know, we are in a time of great change now, uh, in which some of these changes will continue to accelerate. And I thought, well, if I respond to this earthquake with a message from Gaia, will there need to be a message for every earth change? What if there is a flood or where, what if there is a different kind of calamity? And so I sat with Gaia and asked, and what, what shall we do or what do you want me to do? And in that same Gaian way that you're probably already familiar with, Gaia said, of course we have a response. And this time it will be a verbal response and perhaps even a written response. But it will not always be so. <laughs> and in that Gaia way, she said, you are not a newscaster and I am not a public service announcer. And so we will go about it in the way that we do. And so I offer to you uh, this segment on earth changes and on earth changes updates. Funny in some ways how we come full circle as well. When I began to channel Gaia all those years ago in 1994, some of the first information that came to me was about earth changes and I had visions and messages and communications about that all the time until I almost scared myself. And so I said, well, I don't know that I want to, to do this if this is the only kind of thing that this is good for. I'll wake up afraid every day or, or wanting or needing to reach out to someone in some part of the globe where I know that they are. And so for a long time that went dormant and I was able to concentrate on lots of other things. But it does seem as if lately some of those visions and messages have come back. So now that I am so much more familiar with the energy, well, the only thing I can do is respond to the moment in the way that we all do. So greetings to you all. And here's Gaia's message. Indeed, sweet ones, and always a greeting, always the acknowledgement that says the moment is upon us, the time is upon us, our coming together. And as we gather together, for in some ways we do, whether you know it or not, you have become a collective consciousness, a collective reality in which you gather together in moments of your own choosing, but into the same circle into the same fold, Gaia's circle, if you like, as easily as Gaia's voice. And so a topic has arisen that requires our consideration, that requires our attention and our focus. And so we will devote our time to it appropriately. But you see, in order to begin the subject, to allow it to unfold with grace, as it must, it is important to recognize that it is the moment of change, not only for humanity, but for the earth, for everything that is upon it, for those things within it, for the family of Gaia. And so what is the family of Gaia? Well, most certainly the sun. The sun is also the family of Gaia. The other planets within this solar system are also in their own way Gaia or Gaian. It is Gaia's family, after all. Do we not all share the same sun? Do we not move about similar and contrasting positions 
in the solar system? Do we not visit each other's houses, astrologically speaking? We are one and of the same family, and we are one and of the same material of the universe. We are one. And so when there are changes upon the earth, they are changes that the entire universe feels and knows. Do you not know that you also participate in the storms of Venus? Do you not know that you are part of the very ice crystals of which Uranus is formed? You are part of the evolution of the universe, a very significant part of that. And make no mistake, sweet ones, the universe is still evolving. It is becoming. It is making itself. And the earth is no exception in this regard. And in fact, at this particular time, features prominently. And so the earth, it is important that you think of the earth as that which is still evolving. The earth is still being created. It is not done. My body matures. My body becomes more of what it already is. More lovely, more sourceful and resourceful. And you do the same. What is it that you do in your evolution? You seek. You choose. You become. And here and there, those ideas that are no longer suitable, you discard them. You discard that which is not suitable in favor of that which is. Why? So that you might grow. So that the next idea might be a fruitful one so that the next year might have a more bountiful harvest, so that the next truth might be an insightful one, an inspirational one for you and for those whom you bring your light to. You are teachers and students of life. With each thought you light each other's candle. With each idea you bring brilliance to each other's homes and to each other's lives. It is for you to grow, to magnify those things that have value and to allow those things of lesser value, those things that have been spent, to allow them to subside, to bring them to a place of rest. Yes, it would be grand if all of this happened in a state or condition of grace, but that is not for humanity yet, and it is not for the earth yet. So the earth is still being created, even if it does not look like it to you. To you it should look like solid ground. I have built my home upon it. Here, don't move, ever. Ah, but you are indeed on the back of a great elephant, on the back of a great whale. The whale still requires air, and so it reaches, reaches, reaches for the surface. It cannot think when it is reaching to breach the surface. It cannot think what it is displacing in order to do so. It thinks of the next breath, the next sacred breath. The earth as a body must do the same. And so you see, nature is also on its own journey. Nature is also seeking illumination in its own way, in its own capacity. And at times it must displace even you in order to do so. Your objective while you are upon the earth is to grow even as you continue to journey. That objective never ceases to be. There is truly never a point where you stop and say, Oh, look, I'm done. I'm complete. I'm finished. Most often, thoughts like that are last thoughts and bring last rights. That is not where nor who you are. 
Your next breath is designed to bring to you more life, a deeper truth, a more profound vision. It is designed to bring to you the next step, the next open door, the next crossroads to examine and to experience. And so it does. The planets do the same. They continue to revolve and evolve around the sun, never ceasing. They do not stop and think about whether or not they should continue their journey. It is easier or harder. Are there changes taking place upon the surface of those worlds or beneath them? They continue tirelessly. Why? Because it is what they are. And so they do based upon what they are. In a perfect dance. Round and round and round the sun. Bathing in the sun's light. Illuminating within and without. And yes, undergoing as well storms, changes, earthquakes, and eruptions along the way, for that too is life itself. You live now in a world that seems almost a little bit too complicated. It is complicated in the cities that you live, complex systems that you are a part of, family, interrelationship systems, economies interwoven one to another, interdependent one upon the other for the next step or the next day. A complicated world. But why? When did the world cease to be a simple world? And was it ever simple? Yes, yes. Long and longer ago there were simple times and simple truths. But as those evolved, they became complex truths. In other words, they became dimensional truths and dimensional expressions. This did not make them complicated per se. That is somewhat of a human trait, to take the simple allow it to become complex, and then to develop that complexity into the complicated. Now, one of the reasons that the world is as complicated as it is, is that the value, the true value of life has been misplaced. And as a lost treasure, it must be found. The Holy Grail, where is the value to life? Where is the cup of life? And what is it filled with, if not life itself? And so in some ways, the value of life, while not extinguished, is at an ebb rather than a flow. And many will look about their lives say, it has little value. It has relatively little value, some will say. But it is not. It is simply that the value has been laid to rest or because it could not be rested, it was set aside so that it could be picked up again later. And so humanity is now on a search for the value of life, for the value of self. What is self? Why is self? Why is life itself valuable? If all I do is go to work and back in order to support this month or this cycle only to need to do the rest again, where is the value in that? And indeed, the point can be argued. But the value is not in one's endeavors necessarily. The value is in life itself. The value is in the support of life. The purpose of life, as we have said before, is life itself. It is life that values life. It is life that endears itself to life. It is life that gives itself for life. Life lays down its life for life. 
for the evolution of life, for the evolution of mankind, that a child may grow and have a valuable, unique life. And so indeed, value has been somewhat misplaced and it will be found, each one finding value in their own midst, sometimes combing through the beaches, sometimes through a fog, in order to find one's own truth. Strangely enough, yes, it is a time of changes and earth changes that often bring with them some of the greater or greatest truths that the earth has known. It is during times of upheaval and great change that greater humans also emerge, that come the great teachers not to admonish, but simply to add, to add their voice, to add their voice, to add their truth, to bring value to life again, to point the direction perhaps to where it has been mislaid, to where it has been buried, to where it might next emerge. And so many of your myths point to the same thing. Where will value come from next? Where is the next great teaching? Where is the next great teacher? And so they come, and they come from the upheaval. They are born out of the ashes. It is the way. It is the way of the earth to bring about its greatest from what appears to be the least, the least inspired moment, the most difficult, the most oppressive. And out of that dawn, out of that red dawn, comes then the next teacher, the next race, the next truth. And so now is such a time. It is happening throughout the solar system, but of course we speak now of the earth, of earth changes. In order for the earth to continue to change and for you to change with it, at least some of what is taking place must be seen as valuable. It must be seen that there is a wisdom that is coming from the earth itself. And there is. It is a practical wisdom. It is form and formlessness in its expression. And you see, a practical wisdom requires a practical application of that wisdom. It must be recognized, it must be found, and it must be used. If that practical wisdom is not discovered, discovered in time, then it begins to deteriorate and, well, it returns to its source until it is needed again, until it is called for again, until the very cycles of nature bring it out again. So now is one of those times. I will tell you that the ancients of the last cycle called upon this now time called upon the wisdom, called upon the practical wisdom to emerge in the ways that it does. And so nature echoes that request, and it begins to bring from the four corners of the globe, from the six directions, from all of the elements, from all of the kingdoms, there is a response. Nature responds. It can do no less. Nature responds to the will of that which is creator and created. And so during this time in which wisdom begins to emerge again, it does so with upheaval of that which contains less wisdom. Now, this is not to say that those that live, for instance, in zones where there is great change, it is not to say that these are the least wise among you. In fact, perhaps among the contrary. It is instead to say that this is where there is most tolerance for change. This is where there is most tolerance, not for having lives and land upheaved. No, it is instead that there is a tolerance there 
for bringing forth change when change is due. And those whose lives are deeply and greatly affected by these changes in their own way and based upon other lives, promises made, commitments and truths unfolded, they have a command and good reason to be present for these. No one is truly taken by surprise, at least not in the grandest scheme. But yes, when it is looked upon in the third dimension, it can appear so. So now let us continue to explore the whys and wherefores regarding changes upon the earth. Understand that the earth contains all self-correcting environments. The earth does not simply change or bring upheaval in order to do so. The earth is not weak. And by the way, you are not small. Everything has value in this self-correcting environment. And the value of all things and all beings, although perhaps put to the test, is put to the test in a proper moment. And so each environment, whether it is your own organism or your home or the city in which you live, the life that you have chosen, all of these can be called environments. And all of these have the ability to self-correct. To self-correct is not the same as to adapt. That is something different, which we may speak of as well. A self-correcting environment is that which leads to progressive and higher levels of expression, be they thought or frequency or the development of land itself. So self-correcting environments lead to an effective action where kingdoms and elements are concerned. An effective action is that which brings together much or most kingdoms and elements. Perhaps if we were to look at an earthquake this way, you might see that it does in fact bring together great communities of humanity, that it does involve all of the kingdoms, that all of the elements are also at work with that change. And so all of the environments are at work correcting, remaking, in effective action. These times also then require adaptation and true adaptation of all things, meaning adapting to new situations, even if those new situations are earth changes. And perhaps, perhaps, sweet ones, it is time to become accustomed to a different peace, a different way of peace kind that is more common to a world that is still evolving, that is still growing, that is still becoming. It is what you are doing within your own being, within your own body, within your own evolution, within your own thoughts. You are evolving and adapting to change in every instance, in every moment. And the earth is doing the very, very same. Under this time, or flying under the flag, perhaps it is best to fly under the flag of patience during this time, something that does not come easy to humanity. But what is patience then? For today's purpose, we will define it as a reflection upon the living order of nature itself, as a comprehension of the universal order in things and a restoration of that order. And that requires a bit of patience. It is not always a tidy change. It is not always a switch this one for that one and we will go on ahead. At times it brings with it chaos that only later becomes order. But such is the way of nature and it is important to comprehend the universal order in nature. 
that is what the earth follows at this time. Where there is a rumbling, where there is a movement of the earth, where there is an overflowing of a river's banks, where there is an eruption of a volcano, where there are hurricane winds, all of these responses to the universal order in things, the universal order of evolution itself. And evolution has its own timing. It has its own movement. And that is the movement that the earth follows. It is not the movement of a clock. It is not the movement of the stars. But even in this, the stars do lend their frequency, their movement. There is a timing that comes from the very center of the universe. And the earth responds to that. And it responds to it lovingly, compassionately. It may seem to you in the great chaos and loss of these moments that there is no love, that there is no compassion. But I would tell you otherwise. And perhaps were it in my ability to bring to you a vision in this moment of other true chaotic moments upon the earth, you would indeed say, O oh Gaia, this is but a calm move. It is but a stroll in the park compared to how it was. And so do note that from the love of a mother comes that which is a soft slipper's step and not the hard, quick step of a boot in this moment. And yet, we are speaking here of great and powerful forces of nature of which you are one humanity is one it is the time of earth changes sweet ones why why now well as you already know there is a movement toward the great rebalancing that which you may call the 2012 movement or cycle it is not one day, it is not truly one year, it is a cycle. It is a movement of evolution, a true moving from one evolutional cycle to the next. And while that can come about gracefully, there are some steps along the way that are not. This is that time period. And so in this year, the 2010, and the 2011 will be some of the more chaotic years in terms of what you call earth changes of almost every type. Then there will be a smaller, quieter time while the new normalization comes about. And then here and there, there will be a year that is sprinkled as well with a great deal of changes in one form or another. And this cycle will be normal or the new normal until approximately your 2060, by which there will be a smoothing out of time, a different way of time and timing things that you will see by then. So now is the time to become accustomed to change in what ways you can. You may resist them if you like. You may respond to them if you like. You may find a compassionate moment to understand them. But it is the time of alignments. And so the earth is aligning its core not only to the earth's adaptation of light but also in its own way to the entire solar system's move now into a different planetary alignment. The Earth then is part of a dance, carefully orchestrated, but eons ago, but eons and eons ago. And so what appears to be chaos now was a perfectly planned step 
long and longer ago than you can imagine now, and yet I tell you that you were a part of it then as well, that you knew of these moments, that you knew of these steps, and that you were very sure of your wanting to be on the earth now as these steps unfolded. And so the entire earth is moving, but not always in the movement that you are accustomed to, a movement of evolution, a movement in which the core aligns itself just a little bit differently, which aligns the axis of the earth just a little bit differently, which changes many things upon the earth from your own polarity of your mind to the polarity of certain species, the variety of different species, the variety in the expression of genders and how each gender expresses itself, to what degree, how different is one gender than another. The seasons express themselves differently, opposites and yet paired opposites. So it is a time to reflect upon changes of many kinds. When you see something on a grand scale, such as an earthquake, that is the last step in something perfectly choreographed that has been taking place over eons of time. And that great physical upheaval, that great sigh of relief and release and change, that is the last part in that cycle, for all other parts of it have already taken place over eons of time, for that is the way of evolution. Now the question has been put as well, if the axis of the earth is different. How different is humanity's access in that regard? What other relationships or adjustments to the human body, to the human mind, how might these be expressed? Well, again, these changes took place at the soul level long and longer ago than you can imagine. And so when the great time of relief and release comes about, again, it is the culmination of these changes. It is the step in self instead of the planning of the step. Yes, your core is also changing. The core of the human being, the beingness of humanity at the level of community, at the level of self, there are adjustments. For some, they are on a grand scale. For some, they are much smaller. Look again to the planets. There are some that are on the outer level regarding the sun, some revolving much closer, more intimately with the sun. So it is the same with humanity. It depends upon how you individually are revolving around your own sun. You have an inner sun, which is your soul or your soul's correspondence. And of course, you also relate to the outer sun. To some degree, the core of the earth is also a sun. In its own way, it also speaks to you and you respond to the core of the earth. You respond to the outer sun electrically. You respond to the inner sun or the inner core of the earth magnetically. And depending upon how you are arranged, you must balance yourself accordingly. So perhaps there are those that are arranged a little bit too much to the magnetic, perhaps too much to the emotions. They draw too much to themselves. They draw too much upon their shoulders. They draw to themselves the burdens of life. 
this must be rearranged. Then there are those that may be arranged of an electrical nature. They give, here, take this, here, here are these words, do this, take that. They unburden themselves, perhaps a bit too much as well. Not my responsibility, yours. Not my decision, yours. And so you see these times of great changes, they temper. They temper humanity. They do not alter you. They do not necessarily change you. They temper. And not just the personality. They temper the soul. They stretch. They pull. Atoms within you collide. When the plates of the earth collide, atoms within you also collide. In some ways you are all very perfect and powerful. Atom smashers. And so your DNA learns from this, rearranges itself, reorganizes itself, rebalances itself, responds to life a little bit differently and prepares to evolve and to assist others in the same process. Remember that what takes place for one takes place for all. It is not simply those within range of an earthquake that have been affected. It is not simply those that feel the earth move beneath their feet. Oh no, when the earth changes, everything upon and within the earth changes. It is altered by the frequency of that change. It is altered by the rhythm. All things respond then to the electromagnetic energies of the earth and the earth responds to the electromagnetic frequencies, nuances from the sun and from its family, the solar system. And so now during the time of great alignment the earth must begin to shed and change and move and accelerate its dance so that humanity can do the same. For those that truly wish and desire true change for themselves and true change upon the earth, this is that. This is exactly that. It is exactly what you have asked for. It simply does not look like it in this moment. Oh, that? No, I didn't order that. I ordered a peaceful life. Thank you. I did not order upheaval. I did not order drama. Change? Yes. Change that I can observe in others, not myself. And so now is the time to evolve, to change, to discover, to become. And the earth accommodates all of that. Once there are adjustments to the human aspect, we will call it that, there is an aspect of you that is changing. An aspect is another way to say how you view yourself. How you view yourself is changing, redirecting itself. Your axis from within is also then modifying itself. In some ways your axis is becoming more far-reaching. It extends now and will continue to extend further beyond your body. It's a little like to say you are growing and so you are able to stretch a little bit further. It is to say as if you are growing taller, and you will. You will see that humanity will evolve into a taller being over the next hundred years by at least one foot or so. While this extension of self is taking place, your very axis, your reach, 
is extending further from the physical. The further that you extend from the physical body, the more that you are able to sense, to perceive other kingdoms, other elements, other beings, and other truths. This changes that are taking place will allow you to extend your non-physical senses. So your intuitive abilities, your telepathic abilities, your abilities to know what is taking place, where is taking place, the extension of your access to further from the body. When you see those in grand ones and you say, oh, what a great and grand auric field do they have? Look how far it stretches. Well, that is also an acknowledgement then of their ability to perceive into and through other dimensions. And so it is the same with the axis. It extends beyond your own life. So you will continue to be self-centered, meaning that the importance is on the self, on the development of the self, on the expansion of the self. But even as you are self-centered, you will be oriented differently. You will be community-oriented, self-centered, community-oriented, and through the next series of evolutions that are also already in the midst, you will extend into a different aspect of community. So if you like, you may term some of this that is taking place aspecting. You are aspecting. It is another way to say you are glancing in the mirror from a different angle, one that you could not see previously. A different aspect of you or of humanity is being revealed. This will not happen almost as automatically as you would wish. Yet in some ways, as you awaken day by day, something is and has taken place, something from a much deeper and greater place. You are changing from within to without. Already you have seen that there are indeed different patterns in the way that you sleep or how you arrange yourself or how you view yourself. These will increase. You will notice an increase in your behavioral patterns, how you behave on one day compared to another, how you behave in your work cycle as different than your home or off cycle. And in these ways, there will be an acceleration in the younger generations as well. Those generations that are already hardened in their ways, they will notice these changes a little bit less. The softer generations where the mind is not hard, set, here you will notice much more of the changes, a change of mind, a change of idea. And you will begin to see that new thoughts indeed make a new world. So yes, Behavioral patterns, changes in eating and sleeping are to be expected at this time, and they will continue to grow as well. Is there a need to prepare for an earthquake? Can you prepare for an earthquake? No, not necessarily, because not yet can you truly align yourself with the core of the earth and how that core then manages its resources, source to resource, with all of the other languages, patterns, cycles of the solar system. In order to truly predict an earthquake, you, as a language, would need to understand the entire language of the solar system, the language of evolution and of evolutional cycles. And, to be honest here, sweet ones, though perhaps I will lose perhaps one moment of your respect, I will say to you that even I, Gaia, cannot predict the next true moment of awakening, not for you, not for me. And yet I understand them 
perhaps to a greater degree than humanity does, I am able somewhat to prepare, to adjust, to receive. But these moments are not always well-timed, as you have seen, and in fact, at times, are even ill-timed. But who is to say when the child will be born? If one does not always truly know the moment of conception, one does not always know the moment of birth or the moment of chaos becoming order. And so I can say to you with relative security, with relative accuracy, certain truths regarding movements and patterns to the earth, because I am able to see these. I am able to see a building of energies, a desire for movement, a knowingness of what is coming. But the exact moment, I say to you, is more timed by the sun and by the cycle of all things within things. It is not the earth that decides in one moment, today is the day, now, this afternoon. It is not so well timed. And yet, there are patterns and indications, and we will speak of these as well. It has been asked as well whether the two recent earthquakes, those known to the country as Haiti and the country Chile, have these indeed been related? Yes, they are related. They are indeed cords of energy that tie one to the other. But there is also a triangulation of energies that ties them to the far east, for indeed west and east are well corded together. West and east are much more corded together than north or south in this cycle of time. So when you see a great change take place in the east, you may begin to look for a corresponding effect according in the West. Again, it is not necessarily true north to south, not this time, not in this great cycle, though in other great cycles that has been more true and accurate than at other times. It is an energy that moves and moves all things, and so all kingdoms are affected, including the plant and the animal and the mineral and the human. Now to give you an idea, a simple idea of how the other kingdoms experience a great change such as this, an earthquake, an earth change. Well, of all of the kingdoms, I will say to you that the mineral kingdom enjoys it the most. For the mineral kingdom, it feels a bit like you would consider a massage, a hard massage. But the earth rock, after all, is hard, and so it appreciates that hardness, that tempering, that pressure. And so imagine for a moment that in a loving gesture, someone is walking upon your back with very knowledgeable toes and feet that understand every vortice of energy and is there able to release just the right pressure here and to place just the right pressure there. That is a little bit what it feels like to the mineral kingdom. The more pressure that is put upon a plate or an energy or a mass of land, the better that land or mass feels. The more pressure, the more energy that is released. And so in some ways, again, it is a little bit like what you would feel from cracking your knuckles or like that. The mineral kingdom appreciates this great release, a great stretch of energy. And it rewards you, if you like, with precious stones that will only later be retrieved 
received in their own way. For all things that the earth takes, it always gives, but not always in the way that you might imagine. Humanity will come to understand this a little bit more as well. The plant kingdom does not mind these movements as well. It is not particularly as prone to welcoming upheaval, but for the most part it is not truly pulled away from its roots, not in the greater scheme. Its reward then comes from the mineral kingdom, which then releases that which in some ways it has been secreting. Yes, the mineral kingdom releases an energy that is a little bit like a nectar to the plant kingdom, because it is released into and through all of the mineral kingdom of the nearby areas, and these, species by species, is then translated to the entire plant kingdom eventually. Many times you think that a certain plant or tree, flower or shrub appeared upon another continent or country, having brought thereby, human carried thereby, an animal, or what it would be. Sometimes it is the mineral kingdom that through the very currents of energies, through these very large blasts of energy, transmits just the right mineral content, long and through even the lines of energy beneath the earth, so that they can pop up elsewhere where otherwise it would not have been. It creates a unique set of circumstances that is able to redistribute even the plant kingdom in ways that it could not know otherwise. Now the animal kingdom being closest to you, that is a difference there. The animal kingdom is more instinctive than humanity, at least at this time. It is not necessarily more intuitive that humanity can take credit for if it continues to develop this and it is seen that it will. The animal kingdom then being instinctive recognizes the smell of an earthquake. Yes, it has a smell. As you well know, the ability to translate all of the physical senses across long distances is very well developed in the animal kingdom. Well, quite literally, they are able to smell the coming of an earthquake and relatively where it is coming from. In other words, is it coming from deep beneath them or as a wave that is moving to them a wave that is coming from above or beneath the ground or even from the oceans. They can identify which element that particular movement will have more of and they are able to adjust themselves accordingly. And so for the most part they receive the energy and they are transmitters of that energy. They can diffuse some of that, absorb some of that, deflect it, contribute to it, they are able to use it in a variety of instinctive ways depending upon the species itself. They are like great messengers for the animal kingdom and there will be times when it will be able to intuitively guide itself and its entire family either toward an earthquake if that is necessary or away from it for that perspective as well. Now in terms of the changes themselves, earthquakes being related to tsunamis and such, yes, there is indeed a relationship one to the other. There is a relationship earth to ocean and currents of energies, but it is not always true that an earthquake will always bring about a tsunami, at least not one that you would always perceive. You see, there are indeed currents of energies and they would appear to travel all through the oceans and to move water. But sometimes the currents can run even beneath the crust 
They run, in other words, beneath the ocean floor, not above the ocean floor. So while water can be disrupted, while it can be moved by the current, the greater, the more powerful current, the tsunami current, if you like, can move beneath the ocean floor and there smooth out ridges beneath the crust. It can connect energies to other parts of the world. It can relieve great amounts of pressure in other places, other fault lines, elsewhere. And so there is not always the current of tsunami. And here you have one of the reasons why that is the case. Some of the earth changes that are taking place are changing the salinity of the ocean, how much salt the water contains. And there are fissures deep within the earth that allow for a certain amount of escaping gases and pressures. And all of this then allows the water itself to be a little bit less salty than it has been. Further contributions to this come from the glacier melt as well. These melting glaciers are made of a water that is a little bit heavier, a little bit more dense. And as these melt, there is a flowing of these particular waters toward the equator. And as this movement goes to the equator, it begins to displace some of the other water. You cannot see this. It all appears to be ocean water after all. Can you tell the difference of one droplet of water compared to another? No, not necessarily. However, the water is indeed and uniquely different. And so as this heavier water is pushing its way towards the equator, there is more disruption of energies on the belly of the earth, if you like. And so here then we begin to speak of the earth changes themselves and what can be expected. Now here I tell you again, expected is not the same as predicted. For I have given you my word, even as you have seen, that the moment and the timing of such things cannot truly be predicted unless one can also time the entire solar system to the rhythm of the universe. And neither you nor I are completely capable to do that. So we will say instead that we can expect these changes to take place because of the mounting evidence in that accord and, as well, based upon my own previous knowledge of a variety of other cycles, each having undergone in their own way. Again, a great pressure, a greater pressure, is put upon the belly of the earth. And so imagine that the earth, no longer wishing to wear a girdle, then allows a little bit of that girth from the belly, from the equator, to dwell there, to linger there, until it would dissipate of its own, until the waters, the heavier waters of a different makeup, truly begin to merge and mingle with the other waters. That causes a little bit of a disruption, and the earth beneath the waves feels that as well. This creates not only the possibility for more earthquake cycles, but it also then creates between the air and the water a magnitude of energy above the water, which then contributes to how hurricanes are formed and to where these are carried as well. And so the time then of earth changes includes from beneath the water, beneath the crust, earthquake. From above the water, the commingling of water and air, 
a greater increase in hurricane as well as the direction that the winds will move these. It will move these as it's known to, to the Caribbean and the like, but also a little further than that. It will move them further inland. It will move them more toward the Americas and more toward the Central Americas and the southern coasts and eastern seaboard of the North American continent as well, further upward and further inward than they have moved to date. There is an expectation that these will grow in quantity, but not necessarily in magnitude. There is not necessarily great, great and powerful hurricanes, but there will be more of them in a season than there has been before, with one or two, perhaps significant ones, even three, that are significant of the coming year. Depending again how these energies are displaced is what will be created in terms of earthquake. More of the quaking will come from the ocean's crust, more from the ocean's crust and from all nearby coastal levels. This is where most of the pressure is built now. And so in the corridors near the Californias, near all that would be the western coast of the northern Americas, here is where there is more just off the coast and at relatively short intervals from beneath the crust. In other words, they are not very deep where these pressures are, as little as eight, five to eight miles, and as much as 22 to 31 miles as the currents and as the waves of energies are carried. Energies are always in movement. They are always movement. They are not truly stuck energies. And so imagine these great scalar waves moving up and down and through. Well, when the timing of an earthquake comes, it can be on the up beat or cycle or the down beat or cycle, and this creating a greater or lesser quake. Now, to continue along all of the coastal areas of the Alaskas as well, these are also then carrying energy. There are rifts of energies already there and in place. All of the coastlines then relative to the southern Americas, the South American continent, that as well. More to the west, it is more prominent. To the east, to the Brazils, it is less, but there is some that will be affect there as well. More to be known in the Caribbean as well. It is safe to say that the island nations are not safe because they are bordered on all sides for the most part by the waters. And so the crust then, there is where some of the pressure has been drawn. If you will draw an outline round an island, for instance, that is where the pressure gathers all round the outline. And so there is more pressure bearing upon it from all sides, not simply from one side. And so these are more prone then to a disaster-like cycle where these are concerned. There are greater pressures as well to the Japans and to the Chinas and to the islands of the Far East. These are, for the most part, because they are deep in the oceans there, deep in the trenches of the oceans, there is an umbilicus of sorts, if you like, the umbilicus of the earth and of the next cycle. That is somewhat where it is situated. There are openings there that one could lead all of the way to the core of the earth if one could navigate energies with instruments and with certain planes of energy that are less understood now. And so here then is where there is more tugging, more pulling, more cycling, more energy is born there and then distributed round the earth 
but at times it is simply a little shock wave of energy that comes from the center of the earth from the very magnetic core and it jostles these areas and so during these particular cycles of energy the east and the far east will know more distribution of energies and again east to west we have said that there are chords related to each other and so there are more movements in this area as well the poles at this time are relatively stable because it is not as much north to south north to south in essence as long as there is more of a melting of the poles this brings relative tranquility to these energies although it makes it more vulnerable in other areas will say to you that the Canadas the Canadians are relatively safe as well there is less pressure here because it is further to the north those lands that are much and much further to the south they will have less catastrophe as well less disaster and so it is more than given to the center to the middle of the earth and again near and about the equator this is where there will be more but of course remember all all lands are related to one another in the way that they are this gives you but a small idea of what is here of what is coming and of what use is this of what use is it to know where it will be or how it will be a very little in essence for how does one prepare for an earthquake of great magnitude how does one prepare to ride the whale that rises and falls with its own needs and to its own timing well then one can only trust in one's ability to respond to the earth because one belongs to the earth you are in bodies that belong to the earth the bodies that you occupy are made of a material that is of the earth in fact it is earth itself that you occupy you are made of bodies that have oceans of water land masses cords of energy flow and movement of rivers you see you and the earth are one as you begin to understand this and without thinking of yourself as being separate from the earth you will come to know how to move with movement how to change with change how to adapt and how to evolve how to intuit and how to use your instinct what to do how to do it where to be where not to be that is the only preparation that you can have is to develop your senses develop your abilities where you live in fear wondering what will happen next it is much more difficult to develop these abilities where you say to yourself the earth and i are one and as the earth moves i will move so then you will have a different and a greater perspective of course you will say it is easy for you to say such gaia for you are not affected in the way that we are it is not your homes that are toppled it is not your savings it is not your things that have been ruined disturbed and there i will say to you it is so it is so and you are correct but you are beloved to the earth in that which you hold as beloved the earth holds in the same regard and here i will tell you that the earth does not take what does not belong to the earth but the earth does accept that which is surrendered unto it 
there are those that surrender their bodies to the earth. They have chosen it. They have chosen to surrender their life or their body to the earth in such a moment. In some ways, it is a heroic moment for them. It is a moment of great truth. It is a moment of choice. And there is a great surrender. And the earth accepts what is surrendered unto the earth. Of course, it is most difficult for those that do not understand the surrender or would not have chosen the surrender of their loved ones. And what can be said of this? It cannot be said to you, do not become attached to your loved ones. Do not become attached to your things, for they are things, products of the moment. But little good it would do. And so you may react and respond as you do. You will have angers, and you will have moments of grief. You will have great moments of joy and discovery as well. You will find that the earth does not take what does not belong to the earth. And where there is the appearance of that which is taken, you will see that there is that which is given as well. But it does not always appear in the moment. It is not always obvious in the moment. At times it comes now, at times it comes later. But I will tell you that there is a gift, and for that which is taken, there is always something that is given. And so, what can be said of the great and powerful earthquake that has just come about? Indeed, great, powerful, in its own ways, beautiful if you could see what it would look like energetically, you would say, oh Gaia, and how beautiful a work of art is that. Ah, and the pity is that from your physical form and with your physical eyes, you do not see the beauty, you do not see the perfection, you do not see the pressure of the mineral kingdom creating diamonds and sapphires and rubies, no. You see instead the destruction that is left atop. The aftermath is what you see. I beg to you then to look beneath the earth, to use your subtle vision, to use your greater and more profound truth that you carry with you as a being of light, to allow the earth, Gaia, to share with you and to show you if you will close your eyes I will show you the dance that the solar system makes. If you will close your eyes and dream with Gaia, I will show you the earth as it is in its future moments. Close your eyes, travel with Gaia, and I will show you a different version of the earth, another version of you living upon the earth, within the earth, visiting the earth. I ask you to look beyond this moment, not because the moment itself is not valuable, strong and mighty as it is, but because there is more and so much more to the changes that the earth is undergoing now, to the changes that you are undergoing, to the beauties and the perfections, to the profound truth at the core of your being that is being loosed like long, beautiful, flowing hair that has been bound tight for too long and now it is being loosed about you. And so it is with wisdom, practical wisdom to be applied. So it is with knowledge. So it is with discovery and with creativity and with evolution. So comes the cycle now the greater cycle for humanity 
comes what you may call the golden age, the gilded age. But let it come then. Let it come. Struggle if you like, but do not struggle against it. Struggle with the flow rather than against it. Struggle to flow easily through the stream of consciousness. Do not fight against the mind. It is powerful. But instead flow with the consciousness that knows the smoothness of evolution. The fine detail of the artist's brush to paint your life with. Do not make of all things the broad stroke. It is like this because someone said so. It is like that because it was predicted long ago. Do not create an offense to your own ability to know profound love, compassion, and wisdom, to discover it, to use it for your own ability and for the earth and for the good of mankind. So be it, sweets. This is a subject that we will address again out of necessity, out of yearning, out of compassion, for the sake of knowledge and to bring comfort at another time. So we yield to the topic until the next one aligns with us. I bid you good day, sweet ones. Align with the sun and with the light that illumines your path. And there you will always find me to share your cares, your concerns. Always you will find that I am there with a compassionate heart, with a compassionate word. I will make your path light where and when I can. I will make your steps smooth when it can. But when it cannot be, hold your hearts against me and not your thoughts. I bid you good day. <laughs>